One. Hello, everyone, and welcome to NCSL's webinar on COVID-19, Engaging Private Health Insurance for Coverage, Testing, and Treatment. My name is Samantha Scotty, and I will be moderating today's webinar. I am a Senior Policy Specialist with NCSL, and I focus on issues relating to healthcare access, costs, and coverage. Today's webinar is a platform for information exchange and engagement. And over the next 60 minutes, we encourage participation through our chat box. So feel free at any time to type your question in the chat box, which is in the lower left hand of your screen. To build some comfortability with the chat function and also to learn who is on the line today, I invite you to type in the state from which you're joining us now. I also want to briefly mention the resources tab on the webinar platform. So above the presentation, you will see a couple of tabs with one of them labeled resources. Here you can find and download a PDF version of the PowerPoint. Another tab is labeled speaker, where you can read the bio of today's speakers on the line. And you can access these tabs at any time during the presentation. And today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on NCSL's website within the week. Um, for those of you not familiar with our organization, the National Conference of State Legislatures is the bipartisan membership organization that serves the state legislators and legislative staff of all the states, commonwealths, and territories. NCSL provides research, technical assistance, and opportunities for policymakers to exchange ideas on the most pressing state issues and is an effective and respected advocate for the interests of the states in the American federal system. Um, before we jump into today's program, I wanted to briefly highlight a few COVID-19 resources um, available for you all from NCSL. NCSL developed a web page to house our comprehensive resources on the state and federal response to COVID-19. And to view this information, go to NCSL's website at ncsl.org. Um, and from there, you'll see a banner on the top Click it and it will take you to the NCSL Coronavirus Resources for States. So here you can find information on state policies and responses to continuity of government, health, education, fiscal, elections, criminal justice, and more. Um, additionally, today's webinar, today's webinar um, is the second in a four-part series on COVID-19 and the U.S. healthcare system. So in this series, we will explore how various aspects of the U.S. health care system, including Medicaid, private health insurance, health workforce, and health care facilities are impacted by and responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we'd like to thank the Commonwealth Fund for their support of this webinar series and encourage you all to save the dates for the upcoming two webinars. And we will point you to um, our website where a recording is available for the previous webinar on Medicaid. Uh, as the number of confirmed coronavirus cases continues to rise across the United States, bolstering access to COVID-19 testing and treatment is an ongoing concern. So today we will discuss how federal and state policymakers are taking several steps to lower costs to consumers and ensure adequate coverage. Our first speaker, Sabrina Corlett, research professor and co-director of the Center on Health Insurance Reforms at Georgetown U University, will provide an overview of federal and state actions expanding private insurance coverage. After we hear from Sabrina, we will hear two state perspectives. First, from Lori Wing Heyer, Director of Insurance with the Alaska Division of Insurance, and Sarah Bailey, Life and Health Supervisor, also with the Alaska Division of Insurance. And then we will hear from Jane Byer, Senior Health Policy Advisor with the Washington State Office of the Insurance Commissioner. So with that, I will pass it over to Sabrina. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, it's really such a pleasure to be with all of you today. Um, so uh, just real briefly, um, as Sam mentioned, I'm with Georgetown University Center on Health Insurance Reform. And we're a team of about nine people that um, spend all day and every day thinking about private health insurance. Um, and um, thanks to a generous grant from the Commonwealth Fund, we also um, have the privilege of tracking action across all 50 states and DC on um, what they're doing with respect to private health insurance coverage. Um, and this slide just has um, uh, some ways to learn more about what we do and um, to um, get in touch with us uh, either through 
our blog or our Twitter, our, our Twitter account. Um, so first I'm just gonna um, share a few highlights from how the federal government um, is addressing private health insurance and um, COVID-19 services. Um, and it was mainly done through two of the stimulus bills, um, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, or FICRA, and the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security, or CARES Act. Um, so in brief, um, just to quickly kind of recap what um, the feds have done is um, the law requires group health plans and issuers, including grandfathered plans, to cover and waive cost sharing for diagnostic testing for COVID-19. Um, plans and issuers must also cover the items and services that are delivered during a provider office visit, urgent care, or ER visit um, that results in an order for or an administration of a COVID-19 test. Um, these items and services have to relate to determining the individual's need for a test. Um, but if they include influenza or other tests to rule out COVID-19, then um, they must be covered. Um, and subsequent agency guidance has also clarified that these newer antibody or serological tests um, that are coming online are also included um, uh, in this definition of testing. Um, it doesn't matter whether the visit is in person or via telehealth, the carrier still has to cover it. Um, and the law also prohibits carriers from using prior authorization restrictions or other medical management techniques to restrict access to these tests. Um, and then with respect to paying for the lab tests, um, the CARES Act uh, requires plans and issuers to reimburse uh, laboratories um, either the negotiated rate, if one's been negotiated in advance, or the full cash price for the test as listed by the provider on a public website. Um, also, um, the Provider Relief Fund, which folks may be familiar with, it's the um, $100 billion or now $175 billion fund to go to providers. Um, if a provider um, is a recipient of those funds, they have to um, abstain from balanced billing COVID-19 patients uh, regardless of their source of coverage. Um, so there are some um, continued gaps and unanswered questions with respect to the federal protections. Um, there's, there are, first of all, some issues around who is covered. Um, so the law says that um, for the coverage requirement to kick in, the test must be ordered or administered during the visit. However, we know that um, due to capacity limits, um, many people are turning up with symptoms of COVID-19 but being turned away um, after an initial screening because they don't meet all the criteria or because tests are not available. Um, so those folks wouldn't necessarily get the coverage protection. Also, um, the coverage requirements do not apply to short-term plans, healthcare sharing ministries, or accepted benefit products like fixed indemnity products. Um, the tri-agency guidance, and tri by tri-agency, I mean the Department of Health and Human Services, Labor, and Treasury, um, the three of those, those three agencies are responsible for implementing this law. Um, they um, provided some clarifying guidance. Um, they have said that plans and issuers must cover and pay for out-of-network testing, um, including testing done in non-traditional settings like drive-through testing sites. However, the law does not explicitly prohibit um, balanced billing by out-of-network providers um, unless, as I mentioned, um, the provider is receiving funds from the, the CARES Act Provider Relief Fund. Um, so that brings us to what states are doing. And um, when it turns to coverage, the feds have largely been following the state's lead. Um, but before I get into the specifics of what states are doing, I, I do want to do just a quick uh, review, and many of you are already familiar with this, but just in case, um, to sort of help set the stage for the ambit of state regulation of private health insurance. In general, states are the first line of insurance coverage. They are responsible for regulating insurance products and the business of insurance. So. States can regulate individual market coverage, including mark ACA marketplace coverage, employer group plans if they're fully insured, um, and that just means the insurance company is bearing the risk of paying claims. 
Um, they can regulate short-term plans, accepted benefit products like fixed indemnity, healthcare sharing ministries, and um, multiple employer welfare arrangements, or MIWAs, um, a form of which is the Association Health Plans, or AHPs. What states cannot regulate are self-funded employee benefit plans where the employer is bearing the risk of paying claims. Um, also, for fully insured products, if the federal government has set a standard, um, the state may enact stronger requirements so long as they don't conflict with federal requirements. So a common example of this, for example, is that you know, the Affordable Care Act uh, prohibits health insurance companies from using health status to set premium rates. Um, and so that's a national standard. But if a state wanted to say that a stricter standard like prohibiting tobacco rating, they could do that. Okay, well, so let's talk about what the states have done on COVID-19. As I said, the federal government has largely followed the state's lead, lead here. New York's governor, Andrew Cuomo, uh, was the first out of the gate when he announced emergency rules on March 2nd prohibit, prohibiting private insurance companies from imposing cost sharing on enrollees when they visit a doctor's office, urgent care center, or ER to seek COVID-19 testing. His announcement was closely followed by directives in Washington, Alaska, California, Massachusetts, and several more. Indeed, on the eve of FICRA's passage on March 18th, over a dozen states were requiring insurance companies to cover testing without cost sharing. Overall, to date, we've seen 35 states and DC require insurance companies to take some COVID-related action um, in addition to the mandates to cover testing. Um, and several states have also made recommendations that encourage or urge insurers to take action, but they stop short of a full legal requirement. And so I'll be talking about um, both uh, full legal requirements as well as states' action to um, encourage carriers to, to take certain actions. Um, so the first area is COVID-19 treatment. Um, and um, I don't know if folks have seen the exciting news um, that the clinical trials of remdesivir to treat COVID-19 are um, very promising. So um, <laughs> uh, fingers crossed, we have um, a potential treatment coming online that, that's actually successful. Um, and several large insurance companies, um, such as Aetna, for example, and many of the Blues plans, have pledged to voluntarily cover COVID-19 treatment without cost sharing. Um, however, five states and D.C., and you can see them here on this map, are requiring this coverage for all carriers. Idaho is here in light blue because it is encouraging insurers to waive cost sharing for COVID-19 treatment, but it is not requiring it. I should note Michigan and Minnesota here are in dark blue, but they, are, they have a somewhat unique arrangement in that the Department of Insurance on both states brought um, insurance companies in and brokered deals with them in which insurers agreed to cover the cost of treatment. Um, another big issue is um, early refills of prescription medication. And we've seen 20 states in DC require action on this. It's an important support for social distancing and for those who have to self-quarantine. Um, an additional 12 states have recommended that insurers provide this coverage. Um, and essentially, this includes states that um, are requiring insurers um, to cover early prescription refills, um, as well as states that are requiring the length of the supply to be extended, um, typically from 30 days to 90 days. Um, also in the area of prescription drugs, we're seeing some action um, with respect to off-formulary access. Um, supply chain issues as a result of COVID-19 can limit access to certain drugs, and so we've seen seven states and D.C. Um, require insurers to expand access to off-formulary drugs when an on-formulary drug is not available. Um, and five states, um, as you can see on this map, are recommending that expansion. Um, telemedicine. Telemedicine is no longer just a nice bell and whistle enhancement to our coverage. It is, frankly, now essential. We have seen a lot of action here. 23 states and DC require expanded access to telehealth and nine states are recommending it. These expansions are taking several forms. Some states are requiring parity and coverage, some parity and reimbursement um, with respect to um, telemedicine versus an in-person visit. Some are requiring parity in cost sharing or even a waiver entirely of enrollee cost sharing. And some are requiring carriers to 
expand the allowed modes of telehealth. So, for example, requiring them to cover telehealth visits over the phone. Um, some states are also requiring carriers to loosen certain barriers to telemedicine, such as requirements that a patient-provider relationship be pre-existing um, before the telehealth visit. Um, next slide is uh, recognizing that hospital staff are often stretched to the limit in the current crisis. Ten states and D.C. are directing insurers to limit the use of prior authorization to work, reduce paperwork obligations and improve timely access. And 13 states are making this a recommendation. Some states are prohibiting prior authorization only when it's directly connected to COVID-19 services, while others are more broadly applied across all services. Um, another critical issue is access to coverage for the uninsured. Although the Trump administration announced that they would not open a special enrollment period for the federally run marketplaces, of the 13 states that operate their own marketplace, 11 and DC, 11 plus DC have created a COVID-19 related step for the special enrollment period for the uninsured. Idaho is the only state with a state-based marketplace not to do so. 10 states still have their special enrollment periods in progress. Connecticut and Minnesota um, have ended. The District of Columbia just extended theirs to September 15th. Um, states are also taking action on premium payment relief, um, as many individuals and small businesses are struggling right now to make their monthly premium payments. 17 states and D.C. are requiring insurers to take steps to provide this relief. 23 states have made recommendations. And the steps asked that insurers are being asked to take include um, providing premium grace periods, relaxing due dates, waiving late fees, um, or refraining from coverage cancellations. Um, notably, New Jersey, New York, and Washington are also requiring insurers to pay claims during all or part of the grace period. So um, my last slide here is just looking forward um, and how can we address um, continued gaps in access and coverage. Um, and what's the state role? So first, you know, people are going to need help navigating coverage transitions, um, and some people may actually experience multiple transitions in coverage during the course of the year, such as from job-based coverage to Medicaid, or if they start getting some income from Medicaid to the marketplace, they get rehired back to their employer plan. All of this is incredibly complicated, requires navigating very um, arcane eligibility rules, and a lot of people are going to need one-on-one -on -one help. Um, unfortunately, the Trump administration cut the ACA's navigator program by 90%, so there are fewer boots on the ground than there used to be, um, but this is potentially a, an area where states can step up and help. Um, second, a lot more people, in spite of our best efforts, are going to be uninsured. Getting them into the coverage is, is should be the priority, um, whether through Medicaid or Marketplace SEP. Um, but states should also be working with the federal government to ensure that provider relief funds go as much as possible to those safety net providers serving the uninsured. Uh, third, states can help fill in continued gaps in private insurance coverage. If we're ever going to get people back to work and school, we will need widespread, potentially even universal testing. Yet we know from a survey just out this week that lots of people won't get a test due to the fear of the cost. So closing these loopholes is really important. Another issue is that unfortunately we also know that not all tests out there have been FDA approved and some are frankly ineffective. Private insurers can play a role to help providers and consumers use only the high quality tests that actually work. Um, also, due to capacity issues, many consumers, through no fault of their own, may be forced to receive services from out-of-network providers. States can bar these providers from balanced billing patients for COVID-related services. For example, New Mexico has declared that all COVID-19 services are subject to that state's balanced billing protections. Last but not least, we're still hearing that people are facing upfront charges or other bills for using telemedicine services. States can play a very helpful role here, lowering barriers to this critical mode for people um, to access um, providers. Thank you. I'll turn it over now to Lori. Well, thank you. And again, this is Lori Winghire. I'm the director of the division in Alaska. And with me on the line is Sarah Bailey, 
Um, many of you have maybe um, met Sarah at NAIC and other events. She's the supervisor of our life and health unit and has been more than instrumental in our response to COVID. Alaska, when is the COVID, and I don't want to say when it became serious, but when we realized that it was going to come to Alaska, it was just a matter of when and how could we protect consumers. We were able to look back a little on our history in 2018 and pull from it. We had a major earthquake then, and some of what we did, we pulled from what lessons learned during the earthquake. And a couple of those things were the early refills of prescriptions and also the notices of cancellation. Um, as COVID-19 has progressed in Alaska and we have done our, we have had a mandated hunker down as our governor and our mayors refer to it. We have been very fortunate in having slightly over 300 reported positive IDs as far as COVID testing and nine deaths. However, we found some of our challenges as Alaska was our size and that most of the uh, medical community is located in Anchorage, Fairbanks, and Juneau with much smaller hospitals that do not have ICU units in rural Alaska. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Sarah to start and I will be cutting in and out as um, we talk about what happened in Alaska and where we're going and why we made the decisions that we did when we made them. And Sarah, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Lori. Um, and thank you to NCSL for holding this webinar. Um, as, as Lori mentioned, you know, as, as the outbreak of COVID-19 um, uh, was occurring in China, we were watching it closely and we, we knew that we were concerned because while Alaska is remote, we are not isolated. Access to health care has long been a challenge in Alaska due to its size and its rural population. We have a population of 735,000 people spread over 570,000 square miles. Um, many of our residents reside in rural areas without access to ventilators or other advanced life support technologies. In addition to that, the Anchorage International Airport is the fifth busiest cargo airport in the world in terms of cargo throughput and it's the second largest North, in North America in terms of landed cargo weight. Roughly 80% of air cargo traffic between Asia and North America passes through Anchorage. The state also has significant regional connections to Washington State with many daily direct passenger flights into the state. Alaska has a transient workforce in our major industries, including oil and gas, mining, fisheries, and tourism. Many of our workers um, come in and out of the state um, as they change shifts um, biweekly or monthly. Also, a significant portion of our healthcare is accessed out of state, particularly those in the southeast area. Um, 20 to 25 percent of um, healthcare might be received um, on a monthly basis in the Seattle metro area. So we were watching what was happening in Washington State very closely as well. Now, um, I just have a brief timeline. January 28th, um, the Anchorage International Airport and the Alaska Department of Health and Social Services provided support during a layover of the first group of Americans repatriated by the U.S. government from Wuhan. All of the passengers quarantined in California from that flight, and that group had no reports of COVID, but it made us pay very close attention and it, it got us going early. On March 3rd, the, the division had been monitoring the movement of the virus, as I said, and we issued our first bulletin following cases of COVID-19 in a Washington state nursing home. The bulletin addressed preparations for stay-at-home orders, um, as the director had mentioned, such as early refill on prescription drugs, claims handling and utilization review, consumer communication so that insurers were telling their, um, their customers what to expect and then contingency planning for those insurance companies. The initial bulletin, as the director mentioned, also reflected the state's response to the November 
2018 at 7.0 Anchorage earthquake. Um, on March 11th, Governor Dunleavy declared a state of emergency, and on March 12th, Alaska's first confirmed case of COVID-19 was announced, and it was an international cargo plane pilot in Anchorage. During the time the Division of Insurance, um, during this time, the Division of Insurance worked closely with other state agencies, um, and that was very key to, to this. Um, we worked with our um, Office of Professional Licensing to implement emergency telehealth provisions related to the passage of House Bill 29, which we'll, I will speak to later. In addition, we also coordinated with um, the Alaska Health and Social Services, both the Chief Medical Officer and the Medicaid program, as well as the State Employee Health Plan. This coordination helped us know the timing and the coverage of COVID-19 testing that we wanted to require um, by private health insurance. Um, for example, initially we required um, no cost sharing for testing of influenza, RSV, respiratory panels, and COVID-19 along with any office visits. Um, then later, as I've noted in the slides, when recommended by our chief medical officer, the requirement for coverage of respiratory panels was eliminated. The goal behind this was to make sure that people were comfortable going and getting a test because at that time we had high rates of RSV infection and we had high rates of influenza infection. And so we, we really wanted to, to reassure people that if they went in and got a test, that, that they would be diagnosed with the correct the correct illness. Now, in order to ease communication to the public and for insurers and providers, we made efforts to harmonize coverage requirements between private payers, Medicaid, and the state employee plan. So that communication and coordination to us was very important. I just want to speak a little bit to the um, authority that the Director of Insurance has in Alaska. Um, under Alaska Statute 21.06.080, paragraph D, um, she has emergency authority, which allows her to take action if the governor or president has or is about to issue a disaster declaration. Initially, um, we were issuing bulletins and um, recommending actions by insurers. After we issued those initial bulletins, then the director organized the bulletins and we converted this information into orders as the disaster declarations occurred. Um, and, and I've attached links to those orders. The director's authority is good for the shorter of six months or the length of the disaster. This authority can also be renewed if necessary um, on March 28th, the Alaska legislature passed Senate Bill 241, which extended the governor's disaster declaration until November 15th. So you can see in slides 5, 6, and 7, the orders issued by the director, and I'm just going to run through some of these right now. Um, for prescription drugs, we called for insurers to cover early refills, reduce prior authorization requirements, and provide access at retail shops. We wanted to make sure that anyone who needed to get access to drugs could get it um, before they were asked to hunker down or quarantine. Um, we were very concerned with mature or other high-risk um, Alaskans. We also have a requirement to, as I spoke before, to waive cost sharing for respiratory illnesses for the, the diagnostic testing and associated office visits. As I said before, we wanted to encourage everyone to seek testing if appropriate for their circumstances. We have suspended prior authorization or utilization review requirements and um, are expecting insurers to expedite claim payments to reduce administration time and to reduce um, the cost and burden on healthcare providers providers who are currently working very hard on um, COVID-related clinical changes. 
for telehealth coverage, we um, wanted to ensure continued access to necessary health care services um, despite the physical distancing requirements that we were under. And we, we wanted to also, we, we required insurers to um, not apply onerous restrictions on technology requirements. Um, such as a proprietary technology platform. Um, during this time, Medicare also liberalized their benefits and um, HIPAA relaxed their enforcement. And, and so what we saw was that the um, insurers followed suit with, with those things as well. Um, we also have prohibitions on the termination of insurance plans due to non-payment. We, are requiring insurers to keep insurance contracts in effect even if premiums were not paid timely. This requirement is in place until June 1st. We hope that that will um, give a, enough time for employers to um, have a plan and, and to see how Alaska um, does with reopening. Um, we also are requiring continued eligibility of coverage for employees um, despite reduced hours or other changes to employment status. Some employer plans might require employees to work 30 or more hours in order to, uh, a week in order to be eligible for coverage. As some businesses reduced hours or closed, employees were at risk of being dropped from coverage. And um, this all happened so very quickly and, and we wanted to make sure that employees have a choice and, and the ability to, to make a plan for themselves and for their families. As I previously mentioned, the Alaska Legislature passed House Bill 29, which was a, a telehealth um, mandate for our private insurance companies. Alaska already had a, a benefit mandate um, covering telehealth services for mental health care, and House Bill 29 expanded telehealth to all medical services that can reasonably be provided by telehealth. Of course, there are some that um, are, are not appropriate to be provided through telehealth. The bill had been in committee since the legislature convened in January, um, and even before, I believe we had seen it last session. As concerns about the coronavirus increased, it was clear that telehealth was going to be very important as, as we were looking at social distancing. Um, this bill was passed March 11th, and it was signed by the governor on March 16th and was effective March 17th. We worked with the Professional Licensing Division to quickly implement procedures to register healthcare providers, and at the same time, as I said before, Medicare was liberalizing telehealth benefits benefits, which became a very good template for our private insurers. Um, the Alaska law does not require parity of payment um, between in-person and telehealth visits. However, during the disaster, we are seeing insurers offering this expanded benefit. Um, that is something that they are doing voluntarily at this time. Alaska has um, a reinsurance program, a state-based reinsurance program. And 2017, the Alaska legislature passed legislation to form the Alaska Reinsurance Program, which stabilizes Alaska's individual health insurance market. The program is primarily formed, or excuse me, funded through a federal 1332 state innovation waiver. Um, our program covered 33 listed conditions, um, and it, it's fairly unique. I think there's one other state that has a condition-based reinsurance program. Um, most states that have reinsurance programs right now, they have um, a, a, what I would call a traditional reinsurance-based model that doesn't list conditions. So COVID-19, as it was coming in, it, it, it has the potential to introduce new high-cost conditions into our market and increase claim costs, leading to increased premium costs and destabilizing our individual market. So on March 27th, the division issued emergency regulations adding cardio, respiratory failure, and shock, including respiratory distress syndrome to the Alaska Reinsurance Program. We had reviewed some reports out of China to see um, 
some of the, the very severe illnesses that, that people were experiencing there, and, and this is the um, condition that we had landed on to add to our program. Funding for the addition of a condition um, is available to Alaska um, because we actually received more pass-through funding from the federal government than we had initially expected. So we're, we're able to fund this um, through that, that uh, uh, innovation waiver. Now, as we work through the challenges of COVID-19, um, these are some of the changes we found necessary to protect consumers and our markets in Alaska. Um, and we, we hope to be able to um, expand and, and do more as we, as we see that there are other things that need to be done. Thank you very much, and um, I'll turn it back to um, Samantha. Thank you very much, Sarah and Lori, for that um, insight into Alaska's work. And before I pass it over to Jane, I just want to remind attendees that you can submit a question at any time during the event in the at audience chat box. Um, and we will also have some time at the end for question and answer. But I encourage you to submit those now if you have questions. And with that, I will pass it over to Jane um, to hear about Washington's Office of the Insurance Commissioner's response to COVID-19. Great. Thanks so much, Samantha, and thanks for the invitation to present today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Washington State's response. I think because Washington State was the first state in the nation with an outbreak, we've learned a lot, and we have been more than happy to share our experience with other states. And as Sarah indicated, the close relationship between Alaska and Washington in so many ways is a great example of that. Uh, Sabrina did a good job, I think, of talking about the scope of Commissioner Kreibler's authority and noting that we as states do not have the authority to regulate self-funded group health plans. Overall, the commissioner's authority covers about 100, about 1.5 million people who have coverage through this fully insured market in Washington state. And this is, I'm gonna skip over this, this is just a pie chart that shows how coverage is distributed in the state. And so, Given the fact that this is an NCSL event, I did want to take a minute to talk about how critical it was that during this period of time, the legislature had granted the insurance commissioner in Washington state authority to take actions when the governor does declare an emergency. And in Washington state, Governor Inslee issued his first emergency proclamation on February 29th. And so essentially that legislation authorizes the commissioner to modify reporting requirements for claims, to put in place or extend grace periods and modify other duties of people who have insurance, to temporarily postpone cancellations and non-renewals, and with respect to health coverage, most importantly, to take actions to ensure access to care. In Washington state, it sounds like the commissioner's authority is somewhat shorter than that of the Alaska commissioner's uh, authority. The initial duration of an emergency order can be 60 days with a 30-day extension. And then, of course, as long as the governor's emergency proclamation is in place, if the commissioner believes that orders are still necessary, the commissioner has the authority to issue additional orders. But that authority is, is absolutely critical. When Sabrina was going through the list of states and showing the states that were able to require and the states that were encouraging insurers to do certain things, I would not be surprised if the critical distinction between encourage and require was the legislature having provided emergency authority to the insurance regulator. And Sarah, I think, talked about, and I want to really, really emphasize as well, that throughout this emergency, close coordination with the governor's office, with executive branch agencies, and with the legislature has been absolutely essential. 
We are the first to admit that at the Office of the Insurance Commissioner, we are not clinicians. And so we consulted frequently with clinicians at our State Department of Health and with the healthcare authority. Our state healthcare authority purchases both for Medicaid and for public employee coverage. And I'll talk a little bit later about telemedicine payment parity, but as requests were flooding in from providers and from consumers for the commissioner to take action to expand access to telehealth services, we were busily researching what our statutory authority was to issue emergency orders. And we found that given legislation that had recently been enacted by the legislature within literally the past month, the commissioner didn't have statutory authority to order telemedicine payment parity. We immediately reached out to the governor's office and literally within about 36 hours of our of Commissioner Kreidler making the request that the governor use his emergency authority to issue an order he had issued an order related to telemedicine payment parity. And then all throughout this process, we've tried to be as responsive as we possibly could to questions from legislators and legislative staff, and then also to work with legislators to help explore policy options to address the COVID-19 pandemic. So, the insurance commissioner has actually, Commissioner Kreidler has taken a number of steps related to the COVID-19 emergency. With respect to health insurance, he's issued three emergency orders and two sets of what we call frequently asked questions. It is not unusual at all, and I'm thinking that Alaska might have encountered this, for when the insurance commissioner issues an order to have carriers and providers and others submit, well, how should we interpret this? How should we interpret that? And so we've used this format of frequently asked questions to be able to elaborate on our interpretation of our orders. And then just really quickly with respect to property and casualty insurance, the commissioner's issued one emergency order. He's issued guidance to insurers reminding them of their legal obligations when a claim is submitted. And also, very importantly, the insurance commissioner did a market survey related to business interruption insurance coverage. So given how big an issue business interruption coverage is, we could have a sense of whether that coverage is actually available in Washington state and what the conditions were around it. And then we've just recently adopted two sets of emergency rules to try to help keep agents and brokers in a position where they're able to continue to stay in business. So talking more thematically about the actions that we've taken with respect to telemedicine, I think similar to Alaska, in uh, one of our emergency orders, we greatly broaden the methods to provide telemedicine. And one way in which we and several other states departed from Medicare was when Medicaid Care did their expansion of telehealth services, that expansion was pretty much limited to modes of communication that have both audio and video. We, uh, the commissioner made a decision in his order to include telephone. And we did that for two reasons. Number one, uh, for our behavioral health providers, so that where we had individual providers who may not have had access to some of the more sophisticated communication methods, they could communicate via, communicate via telephone. And we also were trying to be really sensitive to the fact that some of the folks who might have needed services, for example, might have an anxiety disorder or some other disorder through which they were more comfortable using uh, an audio only or a telephone means to communicate with their provider rather than sort of the higher tech audiovisual modalities that are out there. And along with our doing this, our state Medicaid agency essentially was doing the same, putting the same policy into effect and our Department of Health issued emergency rules that relaxed some of their requirements that required face-to-face -face contact for behavioral health services. And again, as Sarah mentioned, it was the Office of Civil Rights decision to back off or use their enforcement discretion 
to allow non-HIPAA-enabled means of telemedicine services during the COVID-19 public health emergency. So all of those things were absolutely critical in terms of meeting demand. And we have gotten much feedback from providers thanking the commissioner and thanking the Medicaid program and thanking the governor for the payment parity requirement. And as I had mentioned earlier, the governor did issue a payment parity emergency order. And so the order not only says that the insurer must pay the same amount that they would pay for a face-to-face -face encounter, but in addition, it says that if you have providers in your network, in your provider network, all of those providers need to be able to use telemedicine services in order to provide care. Okay, so with respect to prescription drugs, we did allow, as Alaska did, we did order that commercial health plans provide early refills during the COVID-19 emergency so that consumers could maintain an adequate supply of medication. And about the same time, the Medicaid program issued an emergency rule. So again, trying to be sending consistent messages across healthcare programs. And an issue that did come up was in the commissioner's original emergency order, the commissioner prohibited carriers from applying prior authorization requirements to COVID testing or treatment. But when an announcement, a mention was made by uh, the White House and others about the potential effectiveness of, I think it's chloroquine or chloroquine, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, we had our carriers get back to us and let us know that there was an immediate, very big bump in prescriptions. And given how critical these medications are to people with conditions like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis and having concerns about those folks being able to access these medications, we did allow insurers to place quantity prescribing limitations if they had concerns regarding supply and once again, in terms of the coordination, just before we did that, our medical commission, which regulates physicians, had issued guidance to physicians advising them to please be careful about making prescribing decisions related to these drugs. So another example of the coordination that needed to happen. Other issues that we addressed in our very first order which was issued on March 5th. We ordered, we prohibited cost sharing and we required coverage pre-deductible for COVID-19 testing, respiratory testing and associated provider visits. And as I indicated, we suspended prior authorization requirements. And we also in Washington State fortunately have very strong uh, provider network access rules. And our rules already say that if, a, if, a, if an insurer doesn't have capacity within their network, they must allow coverage or treatment by an out-of-network provider and essentially treat that out-of-network coverage as if the consumer were receiving in-network services. And another issue that had come up as well was our state healthcare authority for the Medicaid program was making massive efforts and are working with our state hospital association in giving concerns about folks that would have to come into the hospital with COVID diagnoses for COVID treatment. There was a lot of focus that was being given to being able to appropriately discharge people who were ready for discharge from hospital to home. And so to try to support that, we said, basically to the insurers that they had to either hold prior authorization requirements for transfer from hospitals to long-term services and supports or at a minimum expedite those requests. And we have all heard a lot about the impacts of the uh, order that the governor issued reducing coverage of non-emergent services. And our state legislature, before it adjourned in mid-March, one of the final things that it did was appropriate $200 million 
for a variety of purposes, including, including supporting hospitals with COVID-19. Sabrina talked about the, uh, the CARES Act provisions, the Provider Relief Fund, the Medicare Accelerated and Advanced Payment Program, although CMS just announced yesterday, I think, or Monday, that they were suspending that program given the $175 million that was going out via the Provider Relief Fund. And we do think there are some small provider organizations that have sought support through the Paycheck Protection Program and the CARES Act. We've also had carriers in Washington State, and not just in Washington State, but nationally, announce efforts to process claims more quickly. United Healthcare announced that nationally. And one of our Blue Cross plans announced um, a couple of weeks ago setting up basically setting aside $100 million to provide advanced payments to primary care and behavioral health providers that could then be recovered over the course of a full year in 2021. And we've all been watching what's happening with health coverage enrollment impacts. With respect to individual and group health plan, the commissioner ordered a minimum 60-day grace period requirement. And as Sabrina mentioned, it was we are relatively unique in that the commissioner has required that during that 60-day grace period, even if premiums aren't being paid, for claims that are incurred during the first 30 days of that period, the insurers do have to pay those claims. And then for claims that are incurred during the second 30-day period, the insurance company does can in, can in essence pen those claims or hold them to see whether the employer or individual comes current in their payments. And the other thing that we have done is we have tried to communicate very, very clearly to insurers that if they're working with their employer groups and their employers want to do something, for example, in order to keep their employees covered, they want to allow employees that are on unpaid leave to remain on their plan, or they want to reduce the minimum number of hours that an employee has to work in order to be able to be eligible for coverage. We are working as hard as we can with insurers to try to have them really, really quickly modify their plans so that they can keep folks covered. In terms of exchange, enrollment in our health benefits exchange, Washington, as Sabrina indicated, was one of the states that set up a special enrollment period for people who are currently uninsured. As of April 23rd, about 6,000 people who were previously uninsured had enrolled in coverage, and that, that special enrollment period lasts until May 8th. And then another 10,000 people have enrolled using the, the, the sort of qualifying event or special enrollment period that allows them to come in when they lose their employer-sponsored coverage. And our state Medicaid program is seeing about 1,000 new folks per day enroll in coverage. So that is what's going on in Washington State. Thanks so much. I'll hand it back to Samantha. Great. Thank you, Jane, for that very informative presentation. And so now we can take questions for Jane or other presenters at this time. Um, and as we are waiting for some questions to come in, I can kick it off. Um, I know that we've heard interest from our members and concern about how associated COVID-19 costs will affect 2021 premiums, um, also keeping in mind uh, that there's uncertainty around fewer claims being processed due to people accessing less care overall such as elective surgeries. Um, so can our presenters comment on these concerns or this uncertainty and maybe discuss how um, potential ways insurers are mitigating increased costs? Um, I could take that first, if you will. This is Lori Winghire from Alaska. We, we have spent a lot of time discussing this uh, because I think that when we suspended non-elective surgeries, I think it was the right thing to do, but it shut down our providers for 
quite a while. And, you know, we were very concerned. I mean, we saw layoffs in certain communities. So if you are in certain um, provider clinics and such facilities. So if you look at that, you would think, okay, if the claims aren't happening, then when COVID, is it going to kind of be a wash? And in ours, because we have been very fortunate in the number of claims, we're not expecting COVID alone at this point to be a really determining factor uh, in any rate increase or decrease as rates are set. The other thing is Sarah talked about is that we did put some money in our reinsurance program so that the individual market we hope will maintain uh, where it's at and not take an increase because we're hoping that those claims would go as a covered condition into the reinsurance program and the insurers wouldn't bear the cost. The one thing that I think we're concerned about and we don't have answers to is that with the number of unemployed that would potentially lose coverage from their employer, um, I mean, we've, we've asked them to keep them on, but I think they can only keep them on for so long, that how many people from group, large or small, will end up either in uh, Medicaid or in the individual market? And that is something we're struggling with getting our hands around as, as far as how many, what could we expect? How many are going to lose group health? And their option is going to be the individual market. And what is the health of that population? Is it better than the individual market? Is it worse? And how will it impact rates? And this is Jane. Uh, I think I, we second what Lori said, except that we don't have a reinsurance program here in Washington State. But I can say we have had many discussions with insurers in Washington State who have raised concern with us. As Lori indicated, we don't know how many people might lose their group coverage and come into the individual market. Um, we don't know how, we know that claims have been going down and that there has been a reduction in claims as a result of delaying non-elective services. What we don't know is when those services will pick back up. And of course, all of that depends upon what happens with, the, with COVID and with the infection rates. Will those pick back up in October or November of this year? Or will people wait and delay those services until 2021, whether because it's been ordered or because they just feel more comfortable waiting a while to come back into the healthcare system? And Washington State does have, I'm trying to remember the exact number of cases that we have, but there is unquestionably a COVID impact in Washington State. We have made the decision not to delay the filing date for individual and small group health plans to come in, and that date is in late May. However, we have traditionally allowed insurers to adjust their rates after the federal government lets insurers know how much money they either will be receiving or will be paying under the ACA risk adjustment program. And so we are considering allowing the, cap the insurers to sort of give us a COVID adjustment later in the process, maybe in July so that they'll have a couple of months more experience to be able to look at their claims and what's been happening. Um, but again, I will note that the if an insurance company loses money in 2020, their rates in 2021 are not calculated to account for what they've lost in the previous year. Their rates are based upon what they think their experience is going to be in 2021. And so we think what we might, what we might also see is insurers who say, okay, I'm going to have to go into my surplus or my reserves to help pay these extra claims. And so when I put together my rates, my requested rates for 2021, I need to have some ability to sort of rebuild those reserves and those surpluses. So those are just some of the things that um, that come into play 
when we're having discussions and reviewing rates. Thank you for that insight. Um, and I believe we have time for one more question. Um, and I will follow up after the webinar if we are not able to get to your question. Um, and it looks like this one is for Jane. Um, has there been any discussion in Washington about maintaining parity for telehealth services after the disaster period? That's a great question. Um, the, the legislature in the bill that they passed in March required payment parity beginning January 1, 2021. And so we now have payment parity in effect. It will hopefully be in effect as long as the governor's emergency order is in effect. We don't know how long that's going to be. If there is a gap between the end of the emergency order and January 1, 2021, it really will be up to the insurers to sort of decide whether, given that they've done all their systems changes to make that happen, they keep that payment parity in place voluntarily until the mandate kicks in on January 1, 2021. Great, thank you so much. Um, and that is all the time we have for today. Again, I am happy to follow up uh, with you directly if we did not get to your question. But I would like to thank everyone uh, for their participation in today's webinar and to our speakers for sharing their expertise and insight. And I would again like to thank the Commonwealth Fund for their support. Um, and finally, I'd like to point our attendees to the additional resources shared on this slide, um, including a resource from the Commonwealth Fund um, and some links to actions taken by private insurers. Also, at the conclusion of this webinar, a very short survey will pop up on your screen, and we'd really appreciate you taking the time to provide your feedback. And this webinar and other COVID-19 resources for states can be found on our website at ncsl.org. Thank you, and have a wonderful rest of your day.